Amen. Amen. You know, I've said it before and I'll say it again that man, we can stop now and go home. We still had church. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Man, I love this church. They're so restrained. <laughs> Amen. Before I get started, let me let me just um, encourage you that I know a lot of times that when we preach, we we try to get as much in as possible, and it's sometimes hard to follow along with the scriptures. If you at all possibly can and want to get a CD. Go back and listen to the scripture references so you can write them down and you can keep up with what's going on um, rather than us to take the time and wait for you to catch up. And to, because God has given us a lot to say every time we get up here. Amen. So uh, I would encourage you to do that. And then when you get done with it, pass it on to somebody else. Amen. Amen. All right. Turn with me this morning to 1 Kings. Chapter 18, verse 17. I'm going to title this sermon, Wet Wood. Say amen when you get there. I'll take that one. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is this you, troubler of Israel? He said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you have followed the Baals. Now then, send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel, together with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. Amen. Preach it, brother. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now let them give us two oxen and let them choose one ox for themselves and cut it up and place it on the wood. And put no fire under it, and I will prepare the other ox and lay it on the wood, and I will not put fire under it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire. He is God. Woo! <laughs> Woo that, there's a sermon right there. And all the people said, that's a good idea. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one of the ox for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. Then they took the ox which was given them, and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they leaped about the altar which they had made. And it came about at noon when Elijah mocked them and said, Call out with a loud voice, for he is a god. Neither he is occupied or gone aside or is on a journey. Or perhaps he's asleep and needs to be awakened. So they cried. Kind of, kind of an antagonizer, wasn't he? <laughs> so they cried with a loud voice and cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out of them. When midday was past, they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was still no voice. No one answered. And no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me, so that all the people came near to him. And he repaired, he rebuilt the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Well, there's another good sermon. <laughs> oh, if we could just have more altars of the Lord being built, rebuilt, repaired. Mm. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. So with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two measures of seed. Then he arranged the wood and cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood, and he said, Fill four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering of the wood. And he said, Do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, Do it a third time. And they did it a third time. The water flowed around the altar, and he, was, he also filled the trench with water. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, 
Isaac and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this, this people may know that you are Lord, O Lord our God and that you have turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and it consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you this morning for the great service that we've had so far. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit that we have felt. And Lord, we need you this morning once again as we begin to, to share your word, Lord, and to give out that which you've given us this morning. Lord, help us as we face this new year, Lord, to go forth, not in defeat, not in gloom and doom, but Lord, looking to you as the answer, Lord, that the fire might fall once again up in this place. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Tonight at midnight, most of you understand that we're going to be turning over a new leaf to a new year. And my prayer for this year is that the fire from heaven might fall just as it did in this story of Elijah. My prayer is that revival would break out as nothing that we have seen in our lifetimes. As the Lord's return is getting so near, we need to see the glory fall once again, the moving of the Holy Spirit within our services, within our churches, that souls are saved and brought into the kingdom of God before the rapture takes place. This passage of Scripture has always been one of my favorites. That's why I took the time to read the whole thing, because you need to understand the story to understand what's going on here. Mm, there's a lot of things that stir me about God's Word. <laughs> but today I want us to notice a very curious thing in our text, and it's this. That before Elijah put God or his own faith in God to the test, he first had 12 Barrels of water poured on the wood underneath the sacrifice. The water was running all over the place. Then even filling up the trench with the water. Elijah was trying his best to make it impossible in the natural for God to burn the sacrifice. Maybe you haven't noticed that you don't start a fire with wet wood. Wet wood can burn, but only if a fire is already intense enough that it will burn it instantaneously. But you don't start a fire with wet wood. Those of you that camp any at all know that. <laughs> but God wasn't restricted at all what Elijah had put before him. He was glorified, actually, in the wet wood. And that was the plan all along. God had sent fire that not only consumed the sacrifice itself, but also the consumed the wood, the stones, the dust, and the water all together that had filled the trench. Glory! <laughs> Amen! I mean, he just doesn't stop at just the sacrifice. He burnt the wood, the dirt, the stones, everything. How many know that God still builds fires with wet wood today? <laughs> I was... I was blessed to hear these testimonies this morning. But church, we've got to understand that God does all things well. God does all things well. When it requires bypassing what we call the normal, He steps in, takes control of things, and puts aside all that we think and know. My God is a miracle-working God. So let's look at a few points concerning God and wet wood. God supplied the scriptures as with fire on wet wood. Because the Bible is compared to fire. Jeremiah 23, 29 says, Is not my word like as a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? And it was even given to us by wet wood. 2 Peter 1.20 says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scriptures is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in the old time by the will of man, but holy men as God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Second Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Proverbs 35, 6 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Add not unto His words, lest He reprove, reprove you, and you be found a liar. God's word is a fire. 
I saw, in fact, I had a quotation. I had it wrote down somewhere, and I lost it. But I saw somewhere this morning as I was on the Internet the reactivation that God works through His Word. I mean, we've got churches out there spending millions on programs and this and that and the fanciest this, the best that, the most something else. When all it takes is the simple Word of God preached under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And God begins to move. God begins to move. God used faulty man to provide us with His pure precepts through His Word. Peter cursed and denied Christ. He was even called Satan by our Lord at one time. Solomon married a thousand women. Man, I can't imagine anybody being that crazy. And he, <laughs> I'm sorry, ladies. <laughs> and he even worshipped idols in his old age. David committed adultery, deception, and murder. Jeremiah even wanted to quit preaching. Daniel let a man fall down and worship him. Paul went to Jerusalem against the clear directions of the Holy Spirit. God even used faulty men to preserve his perfect product. Psalms 12, 6 says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. You shall keep them, O Lord. You shall preserve them from this generation forever. Notice he says, You, O God, will preserve them from this generation. There are actually more verses in the Bible about preservation than there are about inspiration. Mm -hmm. Man still needs the written word of God today. God often uses imperfect, fallible instruments to preserve his word today. The Levitical priesthood of the Old Testament. The priesthood of the believers in the New Testament. We have a perfect, preserved Bible today, not because of the original writers, not because of the King James translators, but actually in spite of all of those frail earthly instruments, because there is still a God in heaven who is able to build a fire with wet wood. Amen. Uh, when people talk about, oh, you know, the Bible is just unreliable, you can't depend upon the Word of God. It was just written by so many men back so much, such a time, and blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. Don't you think, don't you think that the God who sees a sparrow fall, counts the hairs on your head, knows how to preserve His Word through the ages and to keep it viable to speak to us today? Amen. He knows how to get His message across. He knows how to get it done. God saves souls who are wet wood. Psalms 39 says, Verily every man, even at his best state, is altogether vanity. Boy, that doesn't say much about us, does it? Every person who has ever gotten saved was an impossibility, including you. People looked at you and I and said, That's just wet wood. Nothing's ever going to come about of him. They're just wet wood. But every person who now walks in the righteousness of Christ was at one time written off by the world as an impossibility. <laughs> Shows what they know, doesn't it? Why? Because wet wood doesn't burn. They expect dry wood, something that'll set fire. Wood doesn't become anything, wet wood doesn't become anything but soggy wood. But because God had his own plan for each one of us, God was able to turn Satan's plans around. You see, we can't help ourselves. We have no ability of ourselves to ever overcome the sin problem. Because it's impossible to save ourselves even by our own righteousness. Our own righteousness, the Bible says, is like filthy rags. It's nothing. Our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Our mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Our feet are swift to shed blood. Our eyes have no fear of God before them. Our ears are dull of hearing. We're blind, poor, and naked. And we don't even know that we are blind, poor, and naked. Desperately in need of a Savior. You're too weak in body and spirit to save yourself. You're tragically unable to give yourself that new nature, nature that's required or to bring about that dead spirit to life or to live sinlessly or victoriously. You are unable. You are incapable. You don't have that within you to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. 
You can't even pay for the, your own past sins. But Romans 5, 6 says, but For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. It doesn't say some man died to redeem fallen man. It says Christ died for the ungodly. Also, you're too wrong to save yourself. Man's thinking is not right when it comes to saving himself. It may come as a shock, but even with all of our wisdom and knowledge, we could never come up with a plan to save mankind from his sin. And if we could have thought it up, even we couldn't have successfully carried out the plan. We couldn't have done it. Because it required a righteousness that we did not have, could not have, and needed so desperately. Your theories about salvation are all wrong. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know, I thought, of course, I was raised in this all my life. I just assumed everybody knew that. And then I got to reading and, and hearing and working with people that says, well, I'm a good person. I'm just as good as the next guy. I, I go to church every Sunday. Man, I give thousands to the church. I'm down there on the street corner handing out tracts and serving Thanksgiving dinner and Christmas dinners at the, at the shelters. I do all of these things. I know God wants me in heaven. Yeah, like he really needs you. Honey, it's not about you. It's not about you. You could walk on your knees from here to Rome till they're bloody and you couldn't stand up once you got there. You could do all that you could do in the flesh, but it's not going to gain you one ounce of righteousness before God. You're going to just come up a bloody sinner when you went down a bloody sinner. It's all in what Christ Jesus did for you and I on the cross of Calvary. Second Corinthians 6, 2 Corinthians 6.2 says, For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now. Jesus made salvation a right now thing. You know, most of us preachers or most of us that have witnessed to people will get the same old story. Well, you know, I'm not ready right now. Honey, how, no, how do you even know that you'll have the opportunity at any other time? When the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now, that may be the one and only opportunity you'll have. You have no guarantees. God's not making any promises. Today is the day of salvation. John the Baptist was not only a light in his time, but he was also a burning light. We need to be that burning light this morning. God still uses wet wood. He still uses wet wood of the cross of Calvary. The wet wood that was stained with the precious liquid gold of the blood of the Son of God. The only one who could come and save us from, from sin, from hell. It took the wet wood of Calvary to wash away our sin, to redeem you and I. Church, that wet wood cost heaven a dear price. That wet wood was not cheap. That wet wood was not a frivolous expenditure or some afterthought. That wet wood was a result of the battle of the ages fought once and for all for the souls of human mankind. The blood that stained that old rugged cross would be poured out for you and I on the mercy seat of heaven so that our sins could be washed away. So that we could walk forever in newness of life with Christ. I'm looking forward to that, aren't you? Every time old Satan accuses us before the Father, God just looks at, us, looks at the blood of Jesus and he says, What sins are you talking about, Satan? All I see is the blood of my son, Jesus Christ. The blood that was shed on Calvary. The blood that was shed so that you and I could go free in the courtroom of heaven when we deserve death. Now, I don't know about you, but I've, I watch a fair amount of trial shows and things like that and i've never never ever seen one program or one live trial where the guilty guy comes up before the judge 
And the judge is going to pronounce the verdict of guilt and sentence him to death. And I've never seen anybody run up there and get in the, between them and say, Judge, I'll take the sentence. I'll take the sentence. But that's exactly what Jesus Christ did for you and I. That blood was shed so that we could live a victorious life instead of living in condemnation and defeat. That blood was shed for you and I, for, for power. We're facing a new year. Come tomorrow. Let's resolve within our hearts and our minds that when we take on this new year, that we're going to do it in a challenge to face every day that we wake up to saying, I will. I have decided to follow Jesus. Amen. I will serve the Lord. I will serve the Lord. And devil, you're not going to pull that old stuff that you did all last year on me. You know all that stuff you've been feeding in my mind? I got your number now. You're a liar. You're the father of liars. Church, the Bible says to contend earnestly for the faith. Now that doesn't mean just to well, I sure hope nothing happens bad to me today. Sure hope Satan doesn't try to get me to do this or that today. That word contend is like, a, you know, those of you that are familiar with boxing know that they talk about contenders. It means fighting. It means an earnest, fierce fight. Contend earnestly for the faith. You already know the devil's a liar. What are you listening to him for? We've been baptized into Christ, baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection with the promise of eternal life and glory. Oh, if, we, if, if, if the Lord could just pull back the curtain and just give us just a little taste of what's coming, a little taste of what he's promised us. I don't think we probably could stand to bear it. We'd be falling flat on our faces. Mm. Amen. God uses wet wood to strengthen the saints. In 1 Corinthians 1.26 it says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised has God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glorify in his presence. No flesh should glorify in his presence. Honey, I am so sick and tired of seeing television preachers and different ones that are so full of themselves that there's not any room for the moving of the Holy Spirit. That no flesh should glory in his presence. That means me. That means you. That means so-and-so that has that worldwide thing going on. No flesh should glory. I'm talking about this morning the fact that God has built the church for the edifying and the building up of the saints. Do you know that you're no stronger as a child of God than what your involvement is in your local church? Now, I, I know I stepped on a couple of toes there. I felt it right under my feet. <laughs> but it's true. The more involved that you get in your local church, working, becoming a part of it, doing things, the more that you're going to feel a part of it, the more that you're going to feel a part of the family, a part of the, the body of Christ. Because you are. And that's the way it was intended to be. It takes commitment. It takes downright hard work sometimes. All churches are just composed of wet wood, basically. They're all totally incapable of blessing people and building Christian disciples out, outside of the, the supernatural work of an almighty God working through the Holy Spirit. Nothing, nothing much is going to get done. And God has his preachers to build his church. But they all, I think, if in, in honesty, would confess that they're just wet wood. Moses said, I can't speak. David said, I've sinned. John the Baptist said, I'm just a voice. 
Paul said, I am chief of sinners. Peter fell as far away as any man in the Bible, but God used him mightily on the day of Pentecost and after that. God also has his people to build his church. You know, God uses failures that have been saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. You have no idea of what God has in store for you. You may think, well, you know, I just don't know anything. I can't do anything. I've got no talents. I just, you know, I'm just out there. You don't know. You don't have any idea of what God may have in store for you. God can make you into something that you never dreamed of being. There, there aren't any perfect members in His church. I'm sorry to have to say that. I repent. No, I don't. But there are no perfect members, no perfect preachers, no perfect workers, no perfect Christians. We're all wet wood. We are all incapable of doing anything apart from Him. God gave us his, his promise to build His church. In Matthew 16, 18, it says, I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And that doesn't mean that he was the first pope. <laughs> not. It's His church. It's His church. Not some man-made corporate entity that operates on worn-out humanistic principles. Not some dead, dry religion that depends on dead saints and, and tradition to save you. God still leads His people along. He knows how to take care of what He has breathed life into and put into motion. God can do it. If we ever get it through our heads, that would solve a lot of our problems. You know, some of the worst messes we get into is when we start helping God. <laughs> yeah. Now, God, you're, I know you got this thing all wrong, you know. Your, your, your intentions are right, but you're a little slow. So I'm going to help you here. How many, how many have actually done that? I, I have. I'll raise both hands. I have. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. God can even shake up a dead, dry, backslidden society with wet wood. I'm not talking about depending on some dead religion. I'm talking about shaking the soles of your feet with real revival fires. The services that you come into and it feels like the ground underneath you is shaking and you can't stand still. That's what I'm talking about. That's the kind of revival that I want to see. We have a very familiar passage of Scripture in Second Chronicles 7, 13. It says, If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain. Or if I command the locust to devour the land. Or if I send pestilence among my people. Nevertheless, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Whew. I love that passage. I love that passage. Mm. Think about it, church. We have a direct communication with the great God of the whole universe. Anytime, day or night. And we don't have to have a thousand dollar iPhone and a two year contract to get it done. He wants to hear from you. He wants to have communion with you. His greatest desire is to have a close, intimate relationship with each and every one of his people. God can and will turn things around. Oh, I was so glad to hear them sing that song this morning. I love that song. I love that song because it's so true. God can and will turn things around, even in spite of the wet wood of the moral pollution and sinfulness of this land that we live in. Great revivals of the Bible have occurred at some of the most wicked times in history. Look at what happened to Nineveh, how God did a mighty work there. Look what was happening in the time... The Romans occupied Israel when Jesus was born. But in spite of all the wet wood, God still sent the fire of His will. God's will still gets done. I may know that. I mean, we worry so many times about, well, how's this going to work out? Or, how's that going to happen? Or, 
Man, I could sure use some help right now. God knows how to be the God on time. Abortion to God is wet wood. Drug traffic is wet wood. Corruption in politicians is wet wood. Liquor, gambling, cults, and sin are all wet wood because God specializes in making a way where there seems to be no way. He's a God of the impossibilities this morning that we face daily. He's a God that splits oceans, moves mountains, and brings mighty nations to nothing. That's my God. My God can do the impossible this morning. I read somewhere in the pages of that Bible of mine, it says something like, is there anything that my God cannot do? <laughs> Is there anything that my God cannot do? Church, when we get that under our skin, when we get that into our thinking, that I serve a God that specializes in the impossibilities, it may be impossible to you. It may be impossible to the scientists. It may be impossible to the financiers. It may be impossible to anybody, but it's not impossible to the God that I serve. My God can do the impossible. What seems to be impossible to the human eye is just a teaching moment to God. He can stand back and say, let me show you how it's done. He can turn things around in spite of the wet wood of the sins and the rebellion of all the people who are lost. And in spite of all the rebellion and the corruption and the evil dealings that we see in the world today. The main obstacle to revival is not lost people, it's the Lord's people. People who refuse to see their need and who will not get down on their knees and repent and begin to petition God for intervention for a nation that has become so rebellious that God may someday have no choice but to pronounce judgment. He can turn things around in spite of the wet wood of the period in which we live. Perhaps we are the Laodicean church. Perhaps we are already being judged as a nation. But I still believe that revival can come about to an individual heart, to a home, to a church, to a nation, to God's people everywhere if they will obey God. You know, praying by itself as a ritual is not going to gain you much. Obedience and repentance has to be a part of that factor. Now don't get me wrong. God in His infinite grace and mercy can answer anyone's prayer anytime, anywhere, under any circumstances. But I'm talking about a lifestyle of prayer and being able to see consistent results. You can pray till the cows come home, but if you're living outside of the known will of God, if you're living in sin, you're not going to see the fire of fall of the miracles happen or the anointing poured out upon your life like God wants to see happen. God is looking for tears on the altar this morning. God is looking for tears on the altar this morning. You see, wet wood symbolizes the impossibility in the natural realm of being able to start a fire. Elijah made every effort he could to continue to add water and make it impossible for God to, to start that fire. So that when it did start, there would be no doubt as to who it was who was behind it. You ever wonder sometimes why God doesn't come on the scene and rescue you at the first little thorn you got in your toe? Well, you can pull the thorn out. But when God shows up, He likes it to be a time when... When nothing else could have happened. Nobody else could have stepped in. You're at the bottom of the barrel looking up and there's no place to go. That's the God I serve. The God that does the impossible on a regular basis. God used fire many times. Over the laws of nature. He used the fire to speak to the Israelites on Mount Sinai. He used fire all through the Old Testament to get the attention of his people. And most notably on the day of Pentecost when the tongues of fire set upon those that received the Holy Spirit. God sent found fire again. The water that Elijah had his servants to put upon the altar symbolizes the high level of difficulty that was added to that task. Now I know that Elijah was a man of God. But how much faith would you have had to have had 
to say to God, now, I know that you can do this. I know you're going to do it. But there he was with that, within the arm's distance of the 450 prophets of Baal, and no telling how many others that would have killed him on the spot. And yet Elijah is very confident. He didn't worry about it a bit. That's faith. But it symbolizes man's complete inability in himself to create the fire of revivals or to produce any measure of God's righteousness. You know, we've got all kinds of people that try to do different things to, to make, let's make a setting that's holy. Let's do this and that, which will just make everybody feel holy. That's not it. We are unable in the flesh to do that. You can jump, shout, spit, and holler till the cows come home. You can dance and sing and clap your hands, and, but until God shows up, not much is going to be happening. It's just all an exercise in the flesh. Until the Holy Spirit shows up, you might as well just sit back and sell popcorn. Because, honey, the fire just ain't going to fall. That water symbolizes the complete inability of man to stir up even one ounce of the fire of the Holy Spirit. Now, I've seen some pretty audacious efforts to try to drum up something that looked like the moving of the Holy Spirit. But it never really works. In Leviticus 10, 1, it says, Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And the fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Honey, I'm glad that we don't die in situations like that anymore, but there is still a lot of unnecessary garbage that takes place. The fire always has to come from God, and God alone always. The tears that need to be shed... We need to be shedding on the altar that we could cry out to God to have mercy on those of our families that are lost, those that are unsaved, those that are in need of the grace of God to be shed upon them. The problem we have so many times today is there's no tears being shed upon the altar. There's no passion in our praying. There's no desperation in our petitions, no earnestness in our hearts. When in reality, we need to approach the holy altar of God with a broken and contrite spirit, with an attitude of humility and total dependency upon God. We need to come before the throne of grace boldly, yes, but in an attitude that says, God, if you don't move, there's no way this thing is going to happen. We have to come and make the altar wet with the tears and our petitions before God. If we come with an attitude of, what am I going to do? What am I going to do next? He'll just let us go right ahead and do our thing. Fall flat on our face. But when the altar is soaked with the tears of Christians who are desperate enough to reach out and touch the hem of his garment, with the wet, when the wet wood of the altar is soaked with the hot tears of Christians that are praying and petitioning heaven for something to happen. How many times have we prayed and said, Lord, I'm tired of the same old, same old. Give us the fire. Give us a moving of the Holy Spirit and a revival of our services that move us from the heads of our, down to our feet. Help us, Lord. Move us with a fire that when we walk out the door that we're not the same person that came in. But there has to be that desperation, that unction, that need before God that says, Lord, I need you more than anything. I need you more than anything. The wet wood helps us to illustrate our complete inability to add anything to our salvation process. We're wet wood, period. Always have been, and except for the grace of God, always would have been. We can't save ourselves because we're wet wood. 
We can't help ourselves to climb out of the mess we're in because we're wet wood. It's only through the power and the fire of the Holy Spirit that the fire of God can fall and consume the sacrifice of praise and prayer. You're wet wood. I mean, I know there's a lot of people who think they're a flaming dynamite. <laughs> but honey, you're still wet wood. And God wants to do a miracle through you and in you. He wants to bless people through you. He wants to be glorified through you. Will you let him this morning? Will you pray like Elijah until the fire falls? You know, this past month has been one of the toughest ones to deal with that I've had this year, I think. Seems that I've had everything the devil could throw at me. I've fought times of depression, times of oppression, times of trial, and times when the devil would just come right out and say, well, I'll just give up and go home. But I want you to know it all turns out to be just wet wood. It turned out to be in just another occasion that God can say, stand back and see what I can do. It turns out to be just one more instance that God can show that He still has your life, my life, right in the palm of His hand. When old Satan has us focusing on our failures, when he has us concentrating on our own needs, when he has us thinking of what we don't have and what we do have and how impossible this is or that is, it's that time to say, Devil, it's just wet wood. It's wet wood to the God that I serve, and nothing you can do can stop him from sending the fire. Church, God delights in showing us that when times get to be the worst, when times test us sorely, <clears throat> when circumstances are at our worst, that God can send the fire no matter what, no matter how wet the wood is, and glorify himself in that marvelous work. Come and see what the Lord can do. When the church, when the child of God will come to the altar with a broken and contrite heart and the tears begin to fall and the altar is wet with the hot tears of sorrow and desperation, you're going to find that God, the God of heaven, works His very best. When you think there's no way, no how, no answer, to your problem. That's when God does His very best work. I serve a God who specializes in the impossible. Amen? Stand to your feet. Father, we thank You this morning for Your Word. We thank You, Lord, for the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we ask you as we embark upon this new year starting tomorrow, Lord, that you would help each one here realize that we are dependent, totally dependent upon your Spirit. Lord, that we need your guidance, we need your moving in our services, in our lives, Lord, in everything that we do. Help us to go forth from now on, Lord, <laughs> seeking that fire, Lord. Send the fire, send the fire. Send the fire, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.